This conference will now be recorded. So welcome everyone. My name is Caitlin Emmerich with Lynn County Public Health and I'm gonna be the moderator for today's virtual town hall, which focuses on reopening safely in Lynn County. Oh, excuse me. Um, we have four panelists with us today that I will um, allow themselves to introduce themselves here. I'm gonna start with Anna with the city of Cedar Rapids. Anna, would you pre uh, briefly introduce yourself for our attendees today? Yeah, Caitlin, thanks for having me. Um, I am an economic development specialist with the city of Cedar Rapids. My name is Anna Stomp. Um, typically, my work would be a little bit different than the things that I've been working on um, over the last couple of months. So my focus is uh, typically workforce initiatives. Um, but as you can imagine, a lot of the work that we've been doing at the city with the business outreach team has been COVID-19 related. So some of the things that we've been working on um, are partnering with economic development organizations and Gazette Communications to put together a um, directory for resources for our community, um, for a business community. We've also been reaching out to a number of employees just to make one-to-one -one contact and check in and see how they are doing. And then um, just doing research and putting content together to get out there. Our community. Thank you, Anna. I'm going to move to Dr. Cindy Hannawalt next. Uh, Dr. Hannawalt, would you like to introduce yourself to our attendees today, please? Sure. Um, I've been working with Unity Point WorkWell Solutions over the past two years, and I've recently um, transitioned some of my role to be their health and wellness director. During our COVID time, I have been working with Dr. Brady in managing COVID related. Um, company questions as well as uh, employee health questions. So I've been working um, tirelessly in the past week to work with some of our dental colleagues regarding some of the respiratory protection needs that they have, as well as helping our companies understand work return policies, as well as assisting them with understanding screening needs um, and other in-house protocols that will keep their employees safe. Thank you, Dr. Hannawal. I'm gonna move next to Nick Glue. Nick, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Glue. I'm president of Marion Economic uh, Development Corporation. Uh, typically, the role of our organization focuses on supporting our primary employers, which typically are our larger uh, industry, larger companies within the community. And then we're also the lead organization, uh, typically focusing on any new development uh, or expansion projects of uh, business and industry uh, here in the Marion community. Uh, over the last couple of months, our community has really taken a collaborative approach to making sure that we're supporting uh, really all business sectors in our community. Uh, we have a strong partnership and alignment with our Chamber of Commerce as they support uh, our retail sector. Uh, we work very closely uh, with our city uh, to make sure that as a community together, uh, we're supporting more of a holistic approach. Uh, to recovery. Uh, so we've been actively involved in our uh, community's uh, really recovery task force uh, that has been active and, and led by our mayor in our community. Um, we're just trying to make sure that we're listening and then responding with the best resources and information uh, as, as possible. So um, we've been very active in making sure that we have a a very current, very relevant uh, COVID-19 resource page that's at medcoiowa.org. Uh, but we've really just been trying to work together and listen to not just our business sectors, but really uh, understanding the people needs uh, in our community as well as we all work through this together. Thank you. And our fourth uh, panelist for today is Trisha Kitzman. Trisha, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm um, Trisha Kitzman. I am the Community Health Manager here at Lynn County Public Health. Um, that was pretty much my role prior to the last, I don't know, two, three months. Um, I am the Incident Commander with several others for the Unified Command response to COVID-19 um, in Lynn County. My day-to-day -day operations or my normal job would be working with our clinic supervisor and our clinical staff and the assessment and health promotion staff that works on our community health needs assessment and health improvement plan for the community. Um, my background, I'm an infectious disease epi by training. Um, that's what I spent most of my years doing prior to um, getting into more of a management level of public health. 
I think part of our response has been able to obviously do contact tracing and working with individuals who are um, infected with COVID-19, working with employers when they have an employee that has been infected with COVID-19. And now, um, just recently, yesterday, we released our recommendations and guidelines for businesses to reopen in Lynn County um, based on epidemiological data that supports um, the best times to be moving forward and what kind of levels is a phased in approach um, to provide to businesses as they try to make the best decisions for their business, their employees and the community. So um, that's kind of my role. Thank you, Trisha. And I just want to say thank you to all four of our panelists for today. Uh, because of their role in this response, they're all very busy and I just want to appreciate them taking some time out of their day to answer some questions from our community members. So if you're not familiar with the format of the virtual town halls that we have been doing on Fridays, um, the way that it works is there's an opportunity for particip or excuse me, there is an opportunity for residents of Lynn County to submit questions ahead of time. Uh, so we will answer those questions that have been submitted first, and then we will move to questions that are submitted live um, during our time here on the GoToMeeting call. If you do have a question to submit, I ask that you use the chat function within GoToMeeting to submit that question, or you can email it to lcph.meetings at lincolncounty.org. Um, I am the one that's checking that email address and I'll see them as soon as they come up. So feel free to do either one and we'll get to your question as soon as possible. Um, if for some reason we have too many questions to answer, we will get back to you um, at, after the virtual town hall is over and try to answer your question as best as we can. And I know I announced this prior to starting the recording, but we are recording this meeting so others can view it at a later date. Um, and we will post it publicly. The video function and the audio function are the two components that are being recorded. The chat function is not being recorded. So I would just get right into the questions that have been submitted in advance or and identified in advance. The first question um, I think would be most appropriate for Nick and Anna to, to answer jointly if they may. Um, and it's what should businesses be thinking about as they begin reopening? And are there special considerations for retail, restaurants, or other sectors? Nick, do you want to start and then maybe Anna can fill in? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think the uh, the tricky thing is there's there's not necessarily a simple answer uh, to this question, right? There's really uh, multiple considerations for uh, different business types for different business environments uh, depending on if you're a business that relies on heavy flows of, of customers there's just so many diverse uh, considerations and i know one of the things that uh, each of our communities um, between anna and myself have tried to do is put together kind of a guide for those very diverse business types um, so we have really kind of a a, a toolkit uh, that has been launched and um, Gee, if you're a childcare facility, if you're a retail operation, if you're a uh, an, an office type environment, um, it, it it more or less it doesn't always necessarily answer the specific questions, but I think it definitely helps you uh, understand the types of things that you uh, need to be thinking about. You know, if you're a retail business, how how are you going to limit the handling of cash that that everyone touches? Um, if you're an office environment like the one that I'm sitting in uh, alone right now. Um, when people come back, what does having a meeting look like? Uh, even, even uh, you know, I have my own office, but not everyone does. So, how do we how do we meet together um, when we come back? How are we thinking about the the cleaning and sanitizing of high touch surfaces? That uh, I might be the only one in here today but tomorrow there could be someone else in there by themselves and we're all touching the same things. How do we, how do we think about those types of things? Um, one of the questions that we've been getting quite often uh, from some of our larger industry that really, they, they need to travel to install pieces of manufacturing equipment that might be made here in our community. How, what are the policies that they need to be thinking about um, when those people return? Um, 
How do they understand what the policies are going to be like in the various places of the world that they might travel to? Um, there's a lot, there are significant more restrictions in some parts of the world than perhaps uh, what we have here, uh, not just Iowa, uh, but in the United States. Um, how should we clean our restaurants? How should we clean our offices in preparation? Uh, for people to to come back. Uh, what What's your policy on PPE? Um, there's just so many questions that um, the answers are different depending on the type of business that you are in. We have sought to provide some of that guidance through this business reopening toolkit uh, that for us is on our website, medcoiowa.org. It's on our city's website. Uh, it's on our chamber's website. We developed that uh, together uh, with some feedback that we received from our local uh, task force, our, our community recovery task force. Um, I think if there's if there's one job that would be a good one to have right now, it's to be in legal because um, so many of the businesses that we are talking with are, are asking questions that Ultimately, they need to be working very closely. I, I think with their with their legal partners, with with their if they have any outside HR counsel, uh, because there definitely is not a one size fits all answer to maybe even one restaurant compared to the next. There's so many different variables. Thank you, Nick. Is there anything that uh, Anna or Dr. Hannah Wall or Tricia would like to add to that response? So oh, Nick did a great job of um, kind of explaining the position that we're in as we work to support businesses um, in finding ways to reopen safely. Um, there has been a guide that's it's it's really comprehensive um we've been very we've had some very gracious partners like the quad cities chamber that kind of led the way for those guidance um, to be released in iowa um, and they developed a lot of the visual content and framework for when we put our guide together at the city so we also have a, a guide for cedar rapids employers that they can access as well um, and what i would say about that guide um, is that you know we do provide general um, recommendations that would apply to all industry, but it is broken out into different industry types because there are things, um, as Nick mentioned, that are specific to specific industries. So I um, I also wanted to mention that on the city site, we've done something similar to Marion um, in terms of taking the information that we've been see receiving from the business community in terms of inquiries as we've been doing business outreach to put together a frequently asked questions document so that if individuals are interested in things like procuring masks or figuring out whether how they can help best support their employees um, if they can only offer part-time or reduced hours. So those are all considerations um, that kind of go beyond um, just the initial kind of health preparation. Um, in the guide, and I I believe that this will is true for Nick as well, but um, there are links to authoritative sources. So although the guide on the Cedar Rapids side offers practical recommendations, we do link back to sites like the CDC, the Iowa Department of Health, and obviously uh, Lynn County Public Health is a resource that we point um, people in the direction of just from the standpoint of planning that phased approach or looking at things from a clinical standpoint. So we are, although there is guidance, we really are relying heavily on other sources as well. Thank you, Anna. Um, any other uh, additions to the response for this question? The other thing that I would probably point out, this is Trish, and um, I think it really it really is going to be dependent. I know um, it's very hard to kind of create guidance for a one-stop shop or one fits all. I mean, that's just not capable, but looking at it, um, and there are certain businesses that are regulated by various um, industries, such as the Department of Inspections and Appeals are the ones that regulate restaurants. Um, there's various places out there that have some um, additional guidance that I would want to make sure we recommend folks that are regulated by other industries, such as DIA, Department of Inspections and Appeals, IDPH, um, that they are also checking those websites to make sure that they have um, also what the regulatory authority is um, recommending or making sure that they're thinking about. But I think like Nick said, it, it really is, some of these things are really focusing on 
things to consider um, because there isn't a kind of a one stop shop or there's not a one thing that's going to fit each industry. So really focusing on having those hard conversations of what's it look like for my business to reopen, no matter what kind of business, business it is, what's it look like to protect my employees, my business and the community. And I think that's where, you know, the, the various guides that the cities have put out, Marion and Cedar Rapids, they're great, I think, in combination with what um, Lane County Public Health has put together for kind of looking at it from a community disease spread perspective, I think it's going to be key is, is really just sitting down. It's not going to be something that's going to be easy. Some of those decisions aren't going to be easy, but I think the more time you reach out to the partners you're used to working with, looking at your regulatory authority and looking at what's really happening in your community is going to be the, the key aspect for any business as they move forward to open. And I just would like to echo a couple of things that both Nick um, brought up. I mean, from a legal standpoint, we're getting a lot of questions from businesses uh, about how do we best monitor our employees from entering the work site, and they're requesting now sort of that stamp, that seal of approval that they have done everything from a liability standpoint. Um, being in the medical industry, I mean, our job too is to protect the employees, and, and what we haven't seen a lot of is, is looking at your high-risk employees. Uh, a lot of work with OSHA uh, and safe work sites and making sure that businesses take into mind the, the OSHA pyramid to making sure you understand the level of risk that your employees will be at the work site. I mean, are they going to be coming in contact frequently with the public? Um, and that helps you determine too about what their needs are. We understand in healthcare, we're lucky because we have a high level of PPE as long as our resources remain and we can protect the individual that, that are working with known COVID cases. But as we open up the community, we wanna make sure that our employers know that we wanna make sure that our, our employees entering the work site um, are healthy to do so. And we're trying to eliminate the transmission between employee to employee. Um, and and there's, there's different circumstances that we can assist doing that. And that's why the temperature screens and some of the symptom screens are coming into play. And then what do you do when those individuals test positive? So they show up to the work site and they do say they have symptoms and helping guide employers and businesses on when to take the individual out of the work site, when can we safely have them come back so they're not um, infectious to infect the public as well as other employees. And then the last thing, just making sure that we're having that discussion that individuals are at a higher risk from getting, um, once COVID infection hits, if you are an employee that has a high risk, to make sure we take those employees into consideration and how you can modify the work site and making sure that you know they are properly social distancing and hand hygiene and all of those um, are into effect that we know are effective in treating COVID. I mean, this is a pandemic like we've never seen. It's, it's a different organism. It's influenza, um, HIV and protection in healthcare, but th this is now really affecting everybody and all of our industry. We've been taking care of essential workers from the beginning. And so we do have some experience behind of offering that and now making sure that all aspects of business and industry are taking the same precautions to help decrease the spread. Thank you. You all, all have provided a very comprehensive um, list of things that businesses should, should think about as they reopen. Um, as we move to our next question, um, I think that this could be for any of you, but particularly our um, business representatives and uh, the ones that work with businesses. So the second question is, how have you been staying in contact with business owners and providing local support during this time? Anna, you wanna take this one first? I can go ahead and get us started. So um, really early on, and um, just a little aside, I, I started at the city May 23rd. And so we really, I, I kind of, um, have a different experience because COVID has COVID-19 has pretty much taken all over all of my working life. So, uh, but I do have to say, I was really impressed um, with the collaboration in our community. Um, it's been very important to Mayor Hart and the City Rapids City Council that we stay in contact with businesses. So that was really our first strategy to just reach out to um, about 400 of our individual employees or employers uh, just to touch base with them and see how they're doing and what they needed. So that was an initial kind of outreach um, that the city did. But we also partnered with our economic 
development organizations kind of across the county um, and started sharing some of the inquiries that we were hearing back um, from employees and or from employers as they were trying to navigate what their new normal looked like during the time of, of shutdown. And now as they're reopening, um, we've been able to utilize some of that information to inform um, the toolkit and the frequently asked questions that we have put together for businesses to use. So really that's been, our strategy has been to kind of proactively reach out to the business community and assess their needs and get them connected with resources, whether it's, um, connecting somebody who has questions about the PPP program or individuals uh, wanting to know about workforce development programs that would be available to their employees that they've, they've had to furlough or reduce hours. So that's just kind of been our strategy and we're, and we're going forward um, answering inquiries as they come up. Uh, we will have the FAQ and the toolkit be a living document. So as new things become available, um, like what was recently released in Lincoln County Public Health, we'll be linking all of that stuff in um, to that guideline just to make it as comprehensive as possible. And one of the um, one of the fundamental things that as economic developers we do it, it's something that internally we call BRE business retention and expansion and it's it's kind of a boring phrase but it essentially means uh, staying in touch and staying ahead of the needs and challenges of our existing business community so we've we've always had a BRE strategy but when this uh, COVID-19 outbreak uh, began to really move into a community spread scenario. Um, we once again uh, brought in our partners here in the community. Uh, we teamed up with our Chamber of Commerce and interestingly enough, even uh, leveraged some of the horsepower of individual city council members uh, to reach out to our business community. So, the, so we know that you know, Marion Economic Development, we have our investor uh, companies who we have probably the strongest relations with. Our Chamber of Commerce has members that they have uh, their strongest relationships with, but we know that there's still uh, a broad section of other businesses that might not have formal partnerships with either uh, economic development organizations, but are still really important in a community crisis like this for us to be in touch with. So we came up of a with a list of um, about 500 businesses in our community. And for those businesses that we did not have a relationship with, uh, we had council members that said, we will take ownership of this extra list of businesses. And they got on phones and started uh, asking intentional questions about every two weeks. And then we all dumped that data into a shared database so that we could track trends, we could track common responses, and we can really measure uh, how we needed to respond uh, together uh, as a community. Um, that influenced how we developed resource pages. We continue to update that today. And then one of the things that really just rolled out here in the last hour um, that I that I think is important, especially as it relates back even to that first question of what you know, what do businesses need to be thinking about as they reopen? Um, we need to be thinking about what what are their customers thinking, um, and and it kind of relates to um, non retail. What what are our employees feeling as uh, companies consider maybe migrating remote workers back back to the workplace, and so. Um, our city just put out a press release uh, within the last hour that we are launching uh, really a resident readiness survey. Um, it's designed to help retailers understand, gee, what are my customers gonna be thinking about as they come to my place of business? What, what types of things that I might do or spend money on that I think will make my customers feel safe and more confident? Is that is that really how they feel? And so. Um, this this survey right now is on the city's website and it it asks questions like can you rate your physical emotional and economic health uh what are your thoughts on how these business restrictions are being lifted uh at the local and statewide level um, another question how comfortable or uncomfortable are you in doing things like going to the grocery store eating in a restaurant walking on a on a public trail um, we think it's really gonna be some valuable data to help inform our businesses as they seek to create the best environment uh, from a health standpoint, and also you know, get these businesses in a place where you can kind of balance that health 
and economic side. I know that's kind of a constant tension almost between uh, probably even organizations like Lynn County Public Health, and then you have you know the the public policy government side that recognizes we we have to safely figure out how we can keep our economy moving. Um, so anyway, we're looking forward to that, and is is one way that we that we're reaching out to our citizens that we help we hope will help inform our business community in a positive way as well. Thank you. And as a follow up question, um, somebody chatted in a uh, question related to this. So. The comment is, I know it's hard to think of every business between Cedar Rapids and Marion, but when putting this reopening tool together, did you speak with any locally owned small residential cleaning companies? This uh, person continues, uh, Lynn County has done an amazing job giving us guidance, but not all of the small cleaning companies would have been thought, would have been thought of to speak with them. Can any of our panelists speak to any um, guidance or communications with, with cleaning companies? I can. Um, so we we did actually get that question early on um, for companies that are offering industrial cleaning for environments that may have an outbreak. Um, we included the information for contacting cleaning companies and a list of cleaning companies on the Gazette resource, but also have it linked up in the FAQ that we have on the city site and really have relied very heavily on our partner at Iowa State, Cirrus, to put that information together because we have, um, and, and there are some local cleaning companies that are highlighted on that list as businesses are kind of perusing that, um, their options there. What was challenging was with local companies, you know, there are companies who provide cleaning services but may not be prepared to do industrial cleaning services. So we really wanted to make sure that we connected with Cirrus so they could evaluate, you know, whether this was a business that um, had reached out, was prepared or was already marketing that they were helping um, with industrial cleanings. And so that's kind of how we um, went about providing those resources to the community. So again, you can find that information on the Gazette resource um, just at Gazette, the Gazette.coronavirus, um, or you can find it on the City of Cedar Rapids' site in our FAQ. And it's, it is a specific section in the FAQ. Great. Thanks, Anna. Um, this is a good opportunity to for me to share that at the end of our slides here, we do have a list of resources and many of the um, ones that have been mentioned so far are listed on that resource page. Um, we will post those resources to our website along with the virtual town hall information. So um, for anyone that's listening and trying to frantically write things down, um, they'll be posted with the links. Um, I think that maybe partially question three has been addressed um, through some of the responses so far. So I'm just gonna give an opportunity for our panelists to finish up any of their thoughts around this question. Um, what are some of the most common questions and concerns that you have heard from businesses? Is there anything that we've missed in our discussion so far? Yeah, I think an interesting question that I've had is, is about, I, I brought it up earlier, this whole travel you know, uh, thing. I have employees that I need to put on the road. And I, I, I think what I'm gonna say here, applies to lots of business considerations. It seems to me that businesses right now are looking to go to this web page and find this very specific response that has a very specific answer that they can hang their hats on and feel good about. Um, travel is, I think, one of them where right now, at least, uh, especially here in our country, there there is not a specific answer anymore you you should do this even the i spent a lot of time myself yesterday um i had a business that was convinced there was still this statement that 14 day quarantine is required um that's never been anything that has been addressed in a government proclamation there have been guidelines um, there was, it was suggested to me that this officially expired at this date. You, there, that, that's not true. That, that doesn't necessarily e exist out there in the form that businesses are, are looking for. So I think that's, that's, that's the difficult thing is businesses really need to 
uh, adopt a process for how they think about things um, versus versus actually uh, assuming that they're going to out and they're going to go out and find a specific answer. Travel just happens to be one of them and happens to be a question that I've, I've gotten a couple of times just in the last couple of weeks as as some of these businesses really are getting to a point where they're saying, I, I've got to send people on the road because it's it's not really about selling something. It's about, you know, servicing and fulfilling something that I'm already obligated to. So that, that's just been a, a kind of a common one uh, that we've been hearing. Nick, you make a good point that there are recommendations and there are requirements and those change over time. So yeah. it is hard to keep up with um, what the current recommendations are versus requirements and when those expire. Um, any other thoughts on our question number three here about common questions or concerns from businesses? So I, I do have a couple. I, I laugh a little bit because Nick had said he was looking for information about travel and like like authoritative answers on what you can and can't do. And I can't tell you how long I've, <laughs> I've looked into that issue. It just, there's a lot, there there are organizations that do provide guidance, but it is not, there, there are not clear guidelines. So that um, providing the best answers to those questions, I think is what we're kind of trying to do. Just wanted to mention a couple of things that we haven't talked about um, to make sure that businesses are aware that support in these areas is available. So um, one of the areas that we heard a lot of feedback on early on, but then now as they're planning um, to take advantage of programs like PPP and that kind of stuff is um, assistance with modifying what their business plan is. And we do have organizations here in the community that are, are more than happy to help um, small businesses take a look at their business plan, see if they need to make adjustments. You know, the, the market itself is changing. And so um, you can find that information on our FAQ, but you can connect directly with the um, SBDC or uh, the EDC. We have the contact information for organizations that will provide that counseling for businesses. Um, another thing too, that I think w was a question early on and kind of will continue as furloughs end um, are the rules around unemployment and what that looks like for employees. So um, one of the things that I have, I, I really thought is very cool is that businesses are, are mindful of that and want to make sure that there really is no gap for their employees in terms of their income. And so uh, we pointed to programs like the Voluntary Shared Work Program through workforce development if employees are bringing um, employees back but are, are operating at a reduced capacity. So there are those resources that are available too. So we have a lot of partner organizations that can provide more of like the, the consultative piece. And we at the city, Nick's organization, you know, we, we've all been working together and all are, are really happy to help. So um, other than that, the big question right now is assessing whether your business is ready to open. And we've provided some guidance for that too. you're still muted yeah sorry we can't hear you yeah and that's the first time i've done that on all these town halls <laughs> oh don't feel bad i do it all the time <laughs> i apologize so up in, <laughs> um questions number th one through three i think it's because my boss is here um questions one through three have been focused on businesses uh, as we move forward in the questions that were submitted ahead of time uh, they could be applied to businesses, but not necessarily. So question number four um, is related to a business, but also applies to um, just generally within the community. So question number four is, I want to encourage mask use, but I need more information. What types of masks should I look for and where do I get them? Uh, Dr. Hanawalt, is that something that you would be willing to answer for us? Sure, and actually the, the last question, one of the, the common questions that we're getting at the office has to deal with mass use and how we're touching our employers and businesses in the community. We've been putting out an employer correspondence and the one that was just released yesterday was about masking, um, the difference between a cloth mask and a surgical mask and N95s and uh, and the whole concept of the personal protective equipment. And you know, I as we begin to open, we still have to be mindful that the N95 masks, which are the most protective masks that we can offer for healthcare professionals uh, and our dental professionals, that those really are um, 
required in the healthcare system so our healthcare workers can do their jobs um, to take care of individuals. And what we don't want to do is we open up the communities to have that supply even be in greater jeopardy. And we are seeing a lot of correspondence coming from organizations to put in a special circumstances during this COVID time so we can preserve the PPE that we have. And so we know people have been stockpiling. We know that there's been uh, other avenues for people getting masks. And so to be mindful as we open up um, our community is that really wearing a mask, the cloth type mask, and the, I've included that as part of the references on the CDC guidelines, um, just making sure that when individuals are out in the public, when individuals cannot maintain that social distancing of at least six feet away, that to have some type of facial covering. And a facial covering is just a barrier. So the cloth mask that individuals are making at home, there's a, a lot of online sites that now have those available, but you want something that is going to be protected. So something that covers your nose and mouth, something that is secured behind your head or within loops, and to make sure that they're put on properly, that they stay on, that you avoid touching your face, and, and you wear them when you're going to be in the community. It, it is up to employers um, as far as recommendations, but if you're going to have any type of interaction less than that six feet of social distancing to make sure that they have the appropriate type of mask. The surgical masks that we see wearing in the hospital have a better barrier, but they're just that. They're not tight fitting. So in order to protect the user from getting exposed to the virus, you need a form fitting mask. And those masks, in order to be safely worn, you should have some type of fit testing. So we're recommending for mask use is just to per prevent the individual who's wearing them from spreading the virus to somebody else because it catches droplets. It really doesn't do anything to protect from aerosol. Um, and so that's why it's so important that we've talked about cleaning and disinfectant and sanitation to make sure that we have those, those type of uh, programs in place to make sure those high touch points, to make sure you don't share equipment, to make sure you wipe everything down. Um, so the masks are just one part of the whole protection strategy and it doesn't replace the, uh, the need for the other environmental controls. Thank you, Dr. Hanawalt. That was a very comprehensive res response related to masks. I'm going to move us along to question number five, which is how should event planners move forward with celebrations such as graduation parties, wedding receptions, and family picnics that are often planned during the summer? Uh, Trisha, could you touch on this one for us, please? I'm trying to unmute. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yep. Okay, my little thing says I'm still muted, and then so there's like this long delay. Um, we've gotten this question a lot, especially in the last several weeks, more so focusing on graduations. Um, currently, right now, I will be very honest, Lynn County Public Health does not support having any mass gatherings of any type for any reason um, with 10 people or greater. Um, it, we just keep, it's a harder time to ensure social distancing. Um, and it's heartbreaking. This is not this. This is a pandemic, and this is something that we've never seen before in our community. And it's not something that we, as public health, even liked to have to inform families that we we do not recommend having a graduation party. We don't recommend having a family um, event. At least currently, right now, um, we are just at the brink of summer. Or actually, I feel like we're finally just getting out of out of winter. We're getting into spring. But I think as, as time moves on and we continue to meet those metrics of watching the community spread continue to go down as we can, we're on a downhill slide. We're starting to see a decrease um, in our numbers. What's concerning for um, public health for us is that we're seeing a decrease in numbers, but we're not necessarily seeing a decrease in community spread. The numbers are going down because our outbreaks are um, at our long-term care facilities are, are finally starting to um, lessen. So it's not necessarily that the cases are going down, it's the cases associated with our long-term care facilities. So as families are trying to plan ahead, I think um, one of the best things to do is start um, monitoring our website, looking to see which phase we're in. Um, I know it's underneath metrics for reopening um, for businesses, but those same metrics would apply for when we're having mass gatherings or large events. And we do have a, um, a document that is specifically for um, considerations when you're having a mass gathering or a large event. 
And again, right now, um, according to the governor's proclamation, we are still enforcing or wanting um, that if you are to have an event that it has to be 10 or less um, and you have to ensure social distancing, which is um, at least six feet, six feet between you and the participants that are at the event with you. So it's really hard to start thinking about what that may look like for a larger event. But I think as we continue to hopefully see um, the decrease in some of these numbers, we can continue to start looking at what those metrics will look like and what it may look like for the community to start opening up and doing more of those um, family events. But right now, I, I want to be very clear, um, Lynn County Public Health does not support having any type of event that would not um, that would not ensure six foot distance for social distancing and having anybody greater than um, the number of people greater than 10. Thank you, Trisha. And a related question to this is um, that there's some misconceptions about indoor versus outdoor environments. So in question number six is, are there any special considerations for outdoor events versus indoor events? Um, and if either Dr. Hunt Hanawalt or Trisha want to take that one, please go ahead. I'm more than happy to address that. Um, I know from a public health perspective, um, we are not viewing events based on location. So it doesn't matter if it's inside or outside. Um, we were getting that question not only from our um, from our community about hosting events inside versus outside, but also um, area restaurants and businesses that have um, seating outside, you know, are, can they take that into different consideration when they start looking at the, um, the percent of folks that can be in their facility? So as of right now, public health does, does not um, distinguish between an inside and outside um, event. We, we base it off of the mass gathering, the number of people um, ensuring social distancing, whether it's inside or outside. Thank you. And I just want to add for that, I mean, certainly, if you look at events, it's the same thing that we're looking at in the workforce. Um, and so like break times and that, so being able to social distance is easier outside, but it's still the number and the mass gathering um, that we completely support public health on this in order to contain the virus. But just making sure indoors that there's different cleaning requirements, um, there's different surfaces, there's different protocols. Um, so you'll have different contamination um, sources indoors versus outdoors. Completely agree. Absolutely. Can I just add one point of clarification on this? So the, going back to where we talked about guidance versus, um, I guess, government proclamation or actual restriction. Now, Tricia, you mentioned the, the Lynn County Public Health guidance on, on 10 or fewer people. That's an instance where, at least through the end of the month, that is still actually within Gover Governor Reynolds' proclamations. That's that's not just a guidance piece, and I believe that's through through at least midnight on on May 27th for the time being. Could could be extended further. So I think that's actually one where we can say that's not just guidance. That's that's actually some government restriction. Okay. So. Finally, it's something that we can we can we can answer and say it, it's more than just guidance, folks. And I think that's something that the longer we're in this, the general public tends to lose sight of the fact that we are still in this window of time where we need to abide by um, those group restrictions beyond just think about it. Yes, thank you to all of our panelists for uh, the clarifications around that. Very important things to. Remember, I'm gonna move us along to our last slide of questions that have been submitted in advance. Um, I'm gonna remind any of our participants that are attending remotely to, that they can submit their question through the GoToMeeting chat or um, email it to lcph.meetings at lincountyorg um, If any, any questions come in, in in the next few minutes or so, I'll go ahead and take those. We like to keep our town halls um, to 45 minutes or so, which we're coming up on. So um, if you want to ask a question, please ask it now. I am gonna move along to question number seven. So question number seven is how should people ask in public, excuse me, how should people act in public now that things are moving towards reopening? Uh, Dr. Hannah Walt, do you wanna take this one? 
Sure. I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind is like, I want people to act like we're in the middle of a pandemic because we still are. Uh, and, and so, and I, I, Nick's view on things is that everybody wants that, that black and white answer. I mean, are you going to be arrested after the 27th if you have 11 people in your driveway versus 10? Probably not. And I really don't want our police officers to have to do that. But I want people to be mindful that just because we're opening and we're trying to regain the economy and some type of normalcy and, and, and all the social isolation problems that have been happening within this virus, it hasn't went away. And so we need to be mindful and function in public like we are in a pandemic, and in which case, good hygiene, good hand washing, um, social distances, and making sure that you're being respectful for people you're around, particularly our vulnerable members of society. Thank you. Any additions from our other panelists on question number seven? I, I just want to echo, um, I think that's the struggle with public health as we are, um, we do walk the line once in a while in enforcement and have regulatory authority over certain situations. And this one's been a little more on the difficult side, but um, personal responsibility, we are still in, in a pandemic and I echo that, that is um, as a public health professional, going into the community myself is, um, is disturbing at times and making sure that folks understand um, it's not just about your health and safety, it's about the health and safety that of the individuals that you are interacting with when you're out in the community. So I echo it. Um, definitely want to make sure people are taking their own personal responsibilities that we are still in a pandemic. And this is going to is going to be here for quite some time. Thank you. Uh, question number eight is is somewhat related to question number seven. Question number eight is, when should I wear a mask? I think that as things start to open up a little bit, there seems to be some confusion about when you should or should not wear a mask. Um, so Dr. Hanawalt, would you like to take start with this one as well? Sure, and, and I touched on it briefly, but you should wear a mask when you're going to be in contact with other people. Um, and that's because this virus is such that we are seeing transmission before people have symptoms. If it was just such that when you didn't feel well, then you could isolate yourself out of the community and you can wear a mask, but the mask really is put into place so our asymptomatic individuals cannot spread to community members. Um, we can't force everybody, it's not a regulatory thing, we can't make you, we all have, we, we're seeing what's happening with individuals wanting their individual rights on things, but we can be mindful and educate individuals about the purpose of protecting our neighbor and protecting our economy is by allowing us to stay well so we don't overburden the healthcare system and we can continue to have workers at the work sites that we need them to be. Thank you. Does anyone want to elaborate on that answer? I think we've covered it pretty well. Question number nine is, is it okay to see my friends and family? And how can I do that safely? Would either Dr. Hanawalt or Trisha like to answer this question? I can take this one. Um, I think one of the things is, is really looking at I know the restrictions for at least Lynn County have been lifted in the proclamation. Um, for a while there, we had the um, in the proclamation where you were only supposed to interact with those that lived in your household. And that piece has been lifted. Um, so you can interact with other family members, other friends, but again, it's it's keeping that social distancing. It's making sure there's six feet between you and someone else who's outside of your um, household contact. Um, it's really looking at the number of people that are gathering together. You know, are you at 11? Um, it's very similar. I don't want our police department or law enforcement to be having to worry about um, seeing if people are gathering together, but we do want people to be social. We do want you to see your friends. We do want you to see your families, but it's doing it responsibly and ensuring that you are protecting yourself and your loved ones when you are interacting with one another. And, and I just want to add um, one thing on that, 
Trisha, is that when, when people ask me, I mean, all of a sudden we're opening up the nation in America again, we get this false sense like we're over the curve, we're over the hump, we're over the, the contagiousness. And so when seeing friends and family, just be mindful. If you have a family member that is that has a health condition that puts them at risk, uh, then mm -hmm. you different practices. Also know that if you have been around somebody who is COVID positive, there's that 14 day window that, that you potentially can develop the infection. And so, do, I mean, do we have to screen your, your family members the same way that we wanna do the work site? No, but we have to start having those conversations. In my own home, if my kids are, my, my grown children are ill, I ask them not to come over because we know that there's a chance of transmitting the virus. And so I just, that, that 14 day window applies here just like it has applied to work sites. Absolutely, I would I would 100% agree with that. And I think that that's, that's a key thing is um, understanding the risk that you're putting your family members at that are out, that live outside your home if you just choose to interact, um, especially with grandparents and folks that have underlying health conditions. Um, it's not just about seeing them, but also about protecting them when you do interact with them. And what what have you done a couple of days prior to spending time with grandma and really trying to think about the safety and well-being of, of all folks that you you love? And I don't think anybody who wants to, I know how desperate we want to hang out and we want to be together, especially our, our young adults out there, but um, we really need to be conscious on what that really looks like and what that can, what um, ramifications can have if we aren't being smart about it. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have one message to cover. Um, so we'll answer our question number 10 here and then I'll answer or I'll get to that question. So our last question here is, can I have a garage sale this summer? I know there's a lot of discussion on this one. Um, Trisha, can you help clarify for our Lynn County residents um, around the guidance for garage sales? Um, this is a tough one. I'm going to be very honest. I do not support having any type of garage sale at this point in anywhere in Lynn County. I know a couple of our county or a couple of our cities within the county have already banned garage sales within their city limits. Um, I full heartedly support that. And I think most of us in public health would. There, you just cannot ensure there's an exchange of money, there's an exchange of change. Um, I'm assuming most folks aren't doing stuff, um, taking credit cards at garage sales. So there's just really not a real good safe way to do a garage sale. With that being said, to go back to Nick, I don't have any authority or regulatory authority to tell you you cannot have a garage sale unless your city has um, clearly laid it out that you are not allowed to have garage sales in your city limits, but um, being able to ensure the number of people that are there, there's a lot of things that you would have to take into consideration. So if you are in a um, municipality that has not banned garage sales, um, I really encourage you to look at the guidance for mass gatherings and events um, and start thinking about how are you gonna take money? How are you gonna ensure, I guess for lack of a better word, Police the number of people that come into your garage. Are you going to ensure that there's six feet distance between you and your customers that you're serving and the customers that are coming in? Um, I, I just, it's a really hard thing right now to say I support a garage sale in any shape or form as we're still in this pandemic. And um, it makes me very nervous that um, folks wouldn't be masked. There would be exchange of money. There'd be a lot of um, potential interactions that would not ensure six foot distance between you and um, individuals that would be coming into your um, garage or on your yard. Thank you, Trisha. Uh, I have one more question. And this is a question that was emailed. It says, where can we find a list of Lynn County establishments that are requiring staff and visitors to wear masks? Um, I, I have an answer, but I, I think Trisha can probably answer this one as well. Um, Trisha, do you wanna to speak to it? Yeah, um, as far as I'm aware, there is no um, location, no single point to go to figure out who's wearing, who's requiring masks in a certain business and who is not. I think it's a great idea. Um, I kinda like the idea of 
similarly how folks um, in the community on their Facebook or on the Facebook page having who is providing curbside service, who is available. Um, I think that's a great idea if somebody wants to take that initiative. I am not aware of anything, and I'll open it up to the group, but I am not aware of anything that's um, anywhere that there's a repository of who's requiring masks. I will say I, as an individual and a public health professional, I will patronize the businesses that um, require a mask to be worn if I'm in their vicinity. Um, as a public health professional, I feel it's the right thing to do. But um, at the same time, I know that that's, there's, there's a lot of controversy with that. So, but to protect myself and my loved ones, that's what I'm willing to do. But I'm not aware of any type of um, repository anywhere. Or if others are, please go ahead and speak up. No, I think this is a, this is a great question. I don't know of one either, um, but I think it's something that we can look into and explore feasibility on and see if we'd be able to um, reach out to one of our community partners, potentially around organizing a list such as this. Um, a couple of other questions that came in through this email, I think we're gonna um, answer, answer directly because they're not exactly related to reopening. Um, one of the questions is around cleaning products and cleaners still being in short supply. So we, we recognize that as well. Um, as many people are re or reopening, not only do they need to identify masks and where to locate masks, but also those cleaning supplies that um, are still in limited supply. So we can um, try to follow up on that question as well, but um, I understand the struggle there with, uh, we want to do the right thing and sometimes it's hard to because you can't find the resources. So for this person, I will respond offline to that question. So I have not had any additional questions come in, so I'm gonna skip past this uh, slide a little bit. I think we've provided ample opportunity for people to submit their questions. Uh, I just do wanna remind everyone that uh, the 211 line is still available for people that have general questions about COVID-19. There's also um, information on COVID-19 on the Lane County Public Health website, Iowa Department of Public Health and Centers for Disease Control websites. And as time goes on, there becomes more and more information on those websites. Several times throughout our presentation today, we referenced some resources and we did identify many of these resources ahead of time and we can add any that we've missed to this list. So for local resources, the Cedar Rapids Metro Economic Alliance, the City of Cedar Rapids, uh, COVID page, City of Marion, Lynn County Public Health, the Marion Economic Development Corporation, uh, the Gazette, they have a business and a resident resource page. And then for national resources, uh, Dr. Handewalt shared um, some different mitigation strategies that would be apl applicable, especially in workplaces. So the links are listed there. Also a variety of resources on cloth face coverings or masks. Um, Unity Point themselves has a um, instructional page for how to do that. And also CDC does as well. And those do incl include um, ones that you sew and no sew uh, versions of those cloth face coverings. And then there's some additional resources from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration that are available. So up until today, we had been doing a weekly town hall on um, different topics related to COVID-19. And um, we're going to shift our schedule a little bit as not necessarily because COVID-19 is no longer a problem in our community. We've established that we definitely still are in the midst of a pandemic, um, but just because the, inf the rate of the information that is changing is slowing, which is probably welcomed by all of our community members. So we are going to move to a every other week um, schedule beginning in June where we would have the first and third Fridays of the month. So that would mean the next town hall is scheduled for Friday, June 5th. And uh, because we know things change rapidly, we have not yet identified a topic for that town hall, but please feel free to reach out to Lincoln County Public Health um, through either email or social media to let us know if you are specifically looking for a certain topic that we can do our next town hall on. 
I just want to uh, pause to again thank our panelists today for um, their participation and their expertise and taking time out of their day to answer some questions on reopening guidance for Lane County for us. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you.